Uh, we're continuing this series on dirty jobs, these occupations in the Bible. And we have, um, we've done a couple of them. And then last week, this sermon was sort of interrupted for the flow of the Holy Spirit, but I felt like this was still something that God wanted to give to all of us. So, so this one should be better than most. It is two weeks in the making, so, so hopefully it'll be even better than it would have been last week. So turn, if you will, to the Old Testament, to Genesis. We're going to be dealing <clears throat> with the first book of the Bible. This morning, our, our dirty jobs, our occupations are butler and baker. Butler and Baker, and I hope you can, maybe, will know where we're going to go before I say it. Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. Let me give you just a backstory, just to make sure everybody, all of us, is on the same page. We say in the Old Testament, and even in the New, that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those are known as the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, three successive generations of men. The covenant that God established was established through Abraham, his son Isaac, Jacob. Now Jacob comes along, he has 12 sons. The 11th of his 12 sons, second to the last, is a boy named Joseph. And Joseph is kind of an odd kid, he's not the oldest, and he has these very odd dreams and visions. He tells his family, I, see a, I had a dream where all my older brothers were bowing down to me, and even mom and dad were worshiping me. And if though you are the younger sibling, you can imagine, or the older sibling, maybe that was not well received by his siblings. And even his dad said, hey man, you got to keep that to yourself. <laughs> so so the, uh, the 10 older brothers did not freely receive that wonderful vision of them worshiping their younger brother. And so they decided first they were going to kill him. And then they decided, well, we don't want to kill him. We'll simply sell him into slavery. And they sold him to a traveling a uh, band of slavers that took Joseph to Egypt and sold him into slavery in Egypt. He is now separated from his family. His father thinks he's dead and, uh, and, and he's gone. He's a stranger in a strange land. He's sold into the house of a man named Potiphar. And, and, and Joseph respects Potiphar and works hard for him and, and takes care of his household. And Potiphar's wife invites Joseph to have an affair with her. Joseph refuses and Potiphar's wife, in anger and frustration, accuses Joseph falsely of rape. And Joseph is now placed in prison. So I want you to think about this. Taken from Cana to Egypt in slavery. So in a strange land, in slavery, falsely accused, in prison. This is where Joseph is at. However, that's not really what we want to deal with. I don't want to deal with that that happened before and I don't really want to deal with what's yet to come in the life of Joseph. I want to talk very specifically about the beginning verses of chapter 40. So turn, if you will, to Genesis 40, beginning with, with verse 1. It came to pass after these things. What things? All that stuff that we just discussed. Joseph in prison in Egypt, falsely accused. It came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. Let's pray. God, I ask in the next few moments, you will continue to move in this place. You have, you have just encountered us and, and, and filled us and, and spoken to us so powerfully through praise and worship. And we just want you to continue to speak through your word. We long to hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Butler and baker are not two occupations that we probably are super familiar with. I know that we have a couple of ladies that run bakeries here. I know Regina does that, makes cookies and all kinds of things. I know Sherry does cakes and some things like that. But uh, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not sure uh, I ever met a butler. Uh, I'm, I'm not the son of a butler. I'm not a butler myself. I don't run in butler circles, so I'm not sure. Maybe you, I don't know butlers. So I have had some experiences kind of like butlers. When uh, back in the 1980s, for the majority of the 1980s, the governor of the state of Georgia was a man named Joe Frank Harris. And uh, Joe Frank Harris was a governor for majority of the 1980s. My dad had preached at a church 
that Joe Frank Harris's aunt attended. And my dad had gotten to know her through his speaking at this church and through her had gotten to know Joe Frank Harris. And actually dad prayed at one of Governor Harris's inaugurations. So in 1990, my dad had taken a job in central Florida and we were leaving the Atlanta area and moving to Florida. And, and Joe Frank Harris's time in the governor's office was about done as well. And he invited my mom and dad and all three of us kids to attend a dinner at the governor's mansion. So my dad set us down and he was like, listen to me, do not do anything to embarrass me at the governor's mansion. And we were like, yeah, sure. And then he looked me, then he looked me in the eye and he was like, do not do anything to embarrass me at the governor's mansion. I was like, why are you looking at me? He was like, Travis, do not do anything. I was like, okay, fine. I won't. But I was 15 and uh, curious. So the governor's mansion was fascinating. We went there. We went through the gates. We got into the governor's mansion. The governor, Joe Frank Harris, and his wife, they gave us a tour of the mansion. And then we sat down in the dining room to eat. And I was fascinated by the governor's mansion because everything had the seal of the state of Georgia on it. Everything in the governor's mansion. And I thought to myself, nobody is going to believe that I ever had dinner in the governor's mansion <laughs> unless I have proof that I was in the governor's mansion. So I was like, hmm, what could I take that they also wouldn't miss? And so when we left the governor's mansion that evening, I took with me in my pocket a monogrammed napkin from the table that said Georgia governor's mansion because I figured cutlery they're probably going to miss but what's one napkin in a whole house full of napkins and for years and years I had that napkin that had the governor's the seal on it it said governor's mansion on it I no longer own that napkin so governor Kemp please do not send the GBI after me <laughs> I know I would return the napkin if I could so I had, we had this experience, and in that dinner, people came in that worked for the governor and served us, brought us food, did all of this. Another time, in 1986, mom and dad decided in their infinite wisdom to take the three of us on a three-month mission trip to Africa and India, and it was interesting to say the least. During our time in India, we traveled all around India preaching, going to all these different places, and we traveled by train and by ox cart and by truck, and I mean, it was, it was an adventure, and it was India, not India now, it was India in 1986, and it was an adventure. One of the places that we stayed at, they had found a cook who could cook sort of American-type food for us a little bit, but it wasn't really American, it was British food, European food. And this guy had served as a professional cook in India for more than 40 years. So when the, at the end of the week came, he came to my dad and asked my dad to sign his book. And he had a book of all the jobs he had ever had, all the people he had ever worked for. And my dad opened this book and we flipped back to the beginning. And the early pages were signatures and endorsements from British generals in the 1930s when India was still part of the British colony, right? So it's signed by some you know, ridiculous British name, uh, General Archibald Willingham III, right? So it's like this ridiculous... <laughs> ridiculous British name, right? And it's just like, he's, he started in the 1930s. And we, so all these people signed it and dated it. And man, what a good cook he is. What a great job. So my dad did the same thing, signed it, dated it, all of that. So you've, I've had these encounters, but listen to me. Cooking for the governor is fine and good. Cooking for British generals is wonderful. But the cook the baker and the butler for Pharaoh at this moment in time was the most important thing, important butlering job you could ever have. At this moment in world history, Pharaoh is the most powerful man in the world. And these two guys, butler and baker, both work for him in the very halls of power, connected to the royalty and the monarchy. And now, out of nowhere, they're accused of something it's never clear, and they're both thrown into jail. But this really isn't about them. This is about Joseph. 
That's what we want to talk about. Again, we don't want to talk about Joseph yet to come. We don't want to deal with with what has happened to Joseph already. What I want to talk about is this specific encounter with a butler and a baker to Pharaoh. So let's look at that. Turn back, if you will, to Genesis. We just read the beginning of verse of chapter 40. I want you to go back actually to verse 30 or to chapter 39. Look at Genesis 39 and 22. Genesis 39 and 22. And the keeper of the prison, that's the you know, warden, the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. So Joseph is sort of, he's a prisoner, but he's made, I don't know, the trustee. But he's in charge. All the other prisoners report to Joseph. Joseph is in charge of the whole thing. Now, back to 40. Look at verse 4, where we left off in 40. So he's in charge of everything. Now 40 and 4. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them. And Joseph served them. So they were in custody for a while. We read these verses so often and we're familiar with the story of Joseph. But what we want to do is skip to the good part, right? So we know that Joseph was in prison. We know the baker and the butler show up. But we don't often dig into these verses. Look again. Put verse 40 back up on the, on the screen for me for just a second. He is in charge of the entire prison. And the guard, the warden, gives Joseph these two new prisoners. He says, here's Pharaoh's butler and Pharaoh's baker. And Joseph served them. And Joseph served them. He was in a position where he could have demanded to be served. He was in a position where he could have gotten what he wanted. Remember, they are all in prison together. Joseph could have taken this as an opportunity to have the best and the greatest, that he would have the best stuff. I mean, stuff in prison isn't good, but whatever's the best, Joseph would take for himself. Joseph would have the best food, the best drink, the best sell, the best accommodation. Any of the, any of the extras Joseph would take. Instead, the butler and the baker show up. Joseph is in charge of the whole thing, and it says, and Joseph served them. The first thing in Joseph's life is he was committed to serving others. Joseph, over and over and over again, Joseph serves others. This is vital for us to remember. What does Jesus say? He says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve others. Remember, at the Last Supper, one of the last things that Jesus does with the disciples is he sits down and he washes their feet. And Peter says to him, he says, Jesus, you're not washing my feet. You know Peter. He says, Jesus, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus says to him, Peter, if you will not allow this to happen, you have no place in my kingdom. Why? Because Jesus is giving them and us a clear understanding of who he is and what his kingdom is about and what the people in his kingdom are about. And it's about servant leadership. It's about serving others. It's about being helpful to others. It's not about having the best and the greatest for yourself. It's not about exploiting whatever level of leadership you have. You say, well, I have no leadership, but there is something somewhere, some person, somehow there's something that you're involved with. There's something that you're in charge of. And it's not about taking advantage of that and having all that you want for yourself. It is about serving others. I used to work for a guy, and whenever it was raining on a Sunday morning, he would pull through the drive through at the church early, get there before everybody else, pull through the drive through early, and walk inside the church. Then he would, in the staff meeting we had before church started, he would toss his keys to one of us on staff and say, hey, go take my car and park it in the parking lot and walk back in. And he would say, I think there's an umbrella in the back. I don't know why. Well, a lot of reasons. I know why I don't work there anymore. But I don't know why that grated on my nerves so much. I think he could see it in my face because he never ever once asked me to park that car for him. And if he had, I would have parked it in the furthest away spot in the corner. (laughs) I'm not perfect. I'm still working through some stuff. So (laughs) I listen, he had an umbrella in the back of his car. 
He had an umbrella in the back of his car. You want to know, I'm not the greatest, I'm not the best. Courtney, be glad to share all the things, right? But listen to me. You know what I do when it rains on Sunday morning, which is frequent in North Georgia? I park in the same spot I always do, and I get the umbrella out of the back of my car that I always have, and I walk inside my office. What I don't do is park it over here under the drive and then throw my keys to Ron and tell him, hey, I want you to move this, or give my keys to Rico. And you know what they do? They do it because they're greater servants than I am. Rico and Ron are much better people than I am. So let me tell you a funny story if we're talking about rain and umbrellas. I have an umbrella that was Courtney's because I'm a man, so I refused to buy an umbrella, but Courtney gave me her old one and has black and white flowers on it, but I don't care because it doesn't bother me. I'm secure in my masculinity, so it doesn't bother me. So I use a black and white umbrella, okay? So one morning we were in my office before service praying. The men in the church were praying over me. And Rico said, Pastor, is that your umbrella? I said, yeah, it's, you know, it's Courtney's old umbrella. She gave it to me. I just use it when it's right. I don't have it that all. You know, I'm trying to explain away my black and white flowered umbrella. <laughs> Rico said, okay. About two weeks later, Rico gave me a brand new Dallas Cowboy umbrella <laughs> that I keep in my car. Do you see what I'm saying? That's servant leadership. That... We always say, how does Joseph get where he's going? It's this stuff. It's the little stuff. It's the things we say, well, I don't understand why I'm not fulfilling my destiny. It's because the destiny gets fulfilled through the small, through the simple, through the obedience, through the diligence. And, 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 and Joseph said, I could take, I could skim off the top. I could take the best of the food that comes into the prison. I could take the best of the bedding. I could take the best of the extras, the best of the clothes, the best of the sandals. I could have the best because I run everything and the warden lets me do it. Everybody answers to me. Instead, Joseph took that time in that terrible place, not to take the best for himself, but to serve others. Now, continuing with those verses, look at Genesis 40. Look at verse 5. Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream, both of them, each man's dream in one night and each man's dream with its own interpretation. And Joseph came into them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. All right. I'm going to be honest with you. I've read, I've preached on these verses before. I'm not sure I ever noticed the end of verse six. Not to do it to you guys in the booth again, but put verse six back up there for me. Joseph looked at them and saw that they were sad. Does anybody see the uh, irony in that verse? They're all in prison. Everybody's sad. Nobody wakes up and goes, oh, great, another wonderful day in prison. Boy, what are we going to do today? This is going to be awesome. Prison again, gruel for everybody, let's go, right? They're all sad all the time, and yet something was different about this level of sadness. There was something that he saw in them. There was something in their face. There was something in their countenance. Joseph was concerned. Joseph paid attention. He was sad. Everybody in prison is sad. Prison is a sad place. It's sad. And yet there was something. He say, I see something different. I notice something. I'm concerned about these guys. I'm paying attention to what is going on in their life. We have to get a hold of that as well. We have to, we, we have, because... We have oversimplified everything. We have, we've lost that ability in a lot of ways to connect on a, on a deeper level, on a more intimate level. So we say to each other, how you doing? And the response is good. That's the response. Even if the response isn't good, you don't have anything else to say, right? Because you need the response. How you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. Great. You shake hands. And go your opposite ways, and nothing is good about either person's life. And we have, to, we have to get a greater level of concern for the people around us. Joseph is a prisoner in prison talking to other prisoners in the same prison, and yet Joseph says, something's going on with these guys. 
Something's wrong. Something's, something's happening here. There's something different. Pay, pay attention. When, when, when you greet somebody and you say, how you doing? And they go, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing all right. What do we always say? Well, I hope things get better. Or what do we say in church? Well, I'll be praying for you. <laughs> good luck with all that. I don't really want to. Good luck, right? Well, I'll be praying for you. Listen, it, over and over and over again in the New Testament, you cannot find a single moment where Jesus rushes past someone. You cannot find a single moment where Jesus doesn't have time for somebody. Even when little kids come to Jesus, the adults go, hey, 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 get these kids out of here. And Jesus says, let the little kids come and let the diseased come and let the blind come and let the lepers come and let the sinners come and let the prostitutes come and let the saints come and let the Pharisees come. Let all of them come unto me. He saw, it tells us, and Jesus was filled with compassion for the masses. He saw the crowds. He saw the people that needed help, that had problems, that had pain, that had trauma, and he was filled with compassion for the masses. We, as his hands and feet 2,000 years later, must do the same. We must be filled with compassion for the masses. You say, am I supposed to help every single person? But we're supposed to pay attention. Amen. Pay attention. See what's going on. Listen, there's, there may be people in your house that have got real problems. What's going on? What's happening? Why are you sad? If you've got teenagers in your house, there's something always going on. I never know what's happening. So fortunately, I have boys, which are a lot less complicated. Girls, I don't even know what uh, teenage girls, I don't even understand. Didn't understand them when I was a teenager, 46 years old, don't understand them now. Very complicated creatures. I don't, I don't understand the only girl that's in my house much of the time, right? But, but complicated. Are you mad? Oh, that's a scary question. So here's the thing. If you, are you mad? If she goes, no, that means she's mad, but glory to God, not at me. <laughs> if I say, are you mad? And she goes, yeah. Then I'm like, okay, she's mad and it's my fault. <laughs> then we have to figure out what we did to cause the problem. Because most of the time we do not know what we have done. So, <laughs> so and all the men in the house say, amen. So, <laughs> so but listen to me. Be concerned. Pay attention. Pay attention. The, the, I'll give you a perfect example. We just went to men's retreat. We just went to men's retreat, and, and we went up to North Georgia, and on Friday night, we ate at the Dillard House. So that was delicious. We did the Dillard House. When it was over, we had one, one of the waitress that was helping the tables, bringing all the food out, 25 guys, you know, the Dillard House, they just bring family style, and it was just food and food and food and food and food. I didn't think Kevin Braille was ever going to quit eating fried catfish. So <laughs> he, he was sitting next to me. It was just more catfish coming out, and it was never leaving in front of him, and I was what is happening? So it, was, it was, so it was just, but, but with this lady, and you know what? The, we were talking to the manager and some different people, and they said, well, this is the waitress's uh, first time, uh, first week. She's right. Wasn't she new? Wasn't that the thing? Yes, she was new, and it's her first time. She was the manager was talking to the other table. At the end, I'm going to say, it wasn't, it wasn't me. Tim, Rico, and some of those guys, Corey, I said, hey, we're going to gather around this waitress, and we just laid hands on her, and we prayed for her. Because she had a lot going on. She had a lot of stuff, and the manager was saying she's got a lot going on in her life. And listen to me. Just be concerned. Be concerned. Pay attention. Joseph saw those guys walk in to breakfast that morning after the dreams, and he said, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I'm going to pay attention to what's happening in this moment because something is wrong there. Now, final thing, back again to Genesis chapter 40. Look at verse 7. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of his Lord's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? And they said to Joseph, We each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. The final thing, and this is, what, this is what showing concern and paying attention builds to. 
That's the foundation. But this is what has to happen afterwards is Joseph gets involved. Joseph gets involved in their life. He said, why are you so sad? And they said, we had a dream. And he could have said, well, good luck with that dream. I'll be praying for you. Instead, he said, tell me your dream. What is going on? What is happening? He got involved in the lives of the people around him. It is not sufficient that we simply have concern, that we see something seems to be wrong. Something seems that someone seems to be upset. Something's going on in their life. Something seems askew. That is not sufficient for us. We have to pay attention to that. We have to have concern for them. But the call on our life is we must get involved. We must help. We must speak to them. We must do whatever it is that God is calling us to do. And you say, well, does that mean I got to help every single person that I meet? I don't know. That's between you and God. What I know is you need as much help as every single person that you meet. And if everybody that you meet says, do I have to help everybody that I meet? then none of us help anybody. I heard an amazing thing at a leadership conference one time. Everybody that you encounter is trying to find healing from something. Everybody you encounter is trying to find healing from something. And if all of us refuse to get involved with anybody else, how can any of us find levels of restoration and encouragement and, and all of those things, we've got to get involved. Let me tell you a story about me. And often, as you know, my stories about me are not always great. So the beginning of this year, I decided I was going to try and get my health in better order. And so since January, I've been trying to eat better and I've been trying to go to the gym. Now, you may say, it doesn't seem to be working if you're new to the church, but you didn't see what I looked like in January, so (laughs) everything's relative. So for the last four or five months, I've been waking up early and going to the gym before I come into the church and trying to eat better and those kind of things. So about two weeks ago, I get up before 7, about 6.45, I get up, get dressed, head to the gym. I was driving out of my neighborhood, and there was a guy outside of his house on the sidewalk on his cell phone. It's like right at seven o'clock. So it's pretty early. And this guy's fully dressed. He's even got his shoes on and he's on the sidewalk. He's come way down out of his house, out of his front yard. He's on the sidewalk in front of his house and he's kind of pacing back and forth and he's on the phone. And I'm driving up, it's a T stop. So I'm driving up to the stop sign and I'm looking right at him and I'm going to turn and go out of the neighborhood. And I'm driving up just like he was standing at the back of this building. And something was wrong in his countenance, in his behavior. I don't know what it it was, what was happening. But I could just tell as I'm getting closer and closer and closer and closer, something is wrong with this guy. Something's going on with him. It just didn't look like he was on a business call, fully dressed, on his sidewalk at 7 in the morning. I stopped at that stop sign for a minute I said, wonder if I should roll my window down and ask him what's going on. But I live in the back of the neighborhood. He lives in the front. I don't know him. I'd never had any connection to him. He wasn't my next door neighbor. I'd never spoken to him. I was like, I don't know. What if he's just having a business call and I don't want to bother him? And I kind of debated it. And I just said, you know what? I'm not going to worry about it. So I turned out of the neighborhood, went to the gym. About an hour later, I came home. When I pulled in the neighborhood and turned the corner, the front of his house, there was cars parked all over the front of his house. There were three policemen in his cul-de-sac, and the corner van was in the driveway. And I missed it. So later that day, Courtney was taking a walk in the neighborhood, and one of the neighbors was out, and they were friends with them, and they told her... It's so terrible that his wife had committed suicide that morning. And nobody was there. In that moment, nobody was there. He was alone by himself on that sidewalk. 
And God gave me that opportunity to get involved in his life. And I blew it. I blew it. Listen to me. There are people around us in horrible levels of pain and trauma that we don't know about. And it is not God's call on our life to avert our eyes and walk by them. God's call on our life is to get involved. Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. And then he asked a man that asked the question. He says, now, who was their neighbor? And the man that asked the question says, his neighbor was the person who showed him mercy. I could have been a neighbor that morning. And I got too busy, and I got too whatever, and I missed it, and I blew it. And I could have gotten out of my car, and I could have prayed with him, and I could have, I don't know. What was done was done, but I could have offered him encouragement and blessing and prayer and, and hope in that moment. I hate that story. I hate that story. I hate hate that story. But here's the deal. That's not the last opportunity I'm going to have. And that's not the last opportunity any of you are going to have. There are people at your work that you need to say to them, like Jesus said, like Joseph said, tell me what's wrong. He says, tell me your dream. Let me what's happening. I'm showing concern. I'm serving. I'm trying to help you now. Tell me what's happening in your life. What's going on? How can I help? How can I encourage you? How can I lift you up? How can I pray with you? How can I help you? What is happening? What's going on? That is the call. What Joseph did in this moment, that is, that is for all of us. How Joseph lived his life is for each and every one of us. We as followers of Christ must show mercy to others. That, that is what the call is. He, he, he served. Jesus served and he helped and he healed and he prayed for and he encouraged and he fed and he broke bread with. Almost every single story is Jesus having dinner with somebody. He's involved in the lives of the people around him. His call to all of us is to get involved in the lives of the people around us. We have this blessing. We have this encouragement. We have, God has done things in us. And we cannot simply hold it and keep it to ourselves and say, oh, thank you, God. I'm so blessed. Thank you for, thank you for helping me. And then refuse to help others. Our call is to get involved. Now, Joseph does all these things. He says, tell me your dream. And the butler tells him his dream. And Joseph says, I have a wonderful interpretation for you. He said, in three days, Pharaoh is going to forgive you, restore you to your, future, to your previous position, and you're going to be back in the royal palace. And the butler says, wonderful. And the baker says, awesome. My turn. And Joseph says, tell me your dream. And he tells him his dream. And Joseph says, well... I have significantly less good news for you. <laughs> he says, in the same three days, Pharaoh's going to realize that you're the one that did whatever you did, and Pharaoh's going to execute you. And my assumption is the baker did not say thank you for the interpretation. <laughs> and in three days, what Joseph said happened. The butler was restored. The baker was publicly executed. Look, if you will, Genesis 40 and 20 very end of the chapter, Genesis 40 and 20. Joseph, when he interpreted the butler's dream, he told the butler, remember me when Pharaoh takes you out of here. Now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he had made a feast for all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. Then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again. And he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Verse 23. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. But the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. I want to just remind you of this, leave you with this as we finish this up today. You can do everything you're supposed to do. 
You can serve others and you can practice servant leadership and you can be a good guy and you can be concerned. Hey, somebody's mad. Somebody's upset. Somebody's sad. I'm going to investigate that more and you can be concerned and you can pay attention to the people around you. And then when they ask you for help, you can help them and you can get involved and you can, and you can do and go and serve and you can make all the right choices and you can still be forgotten in prison. Just because everything you do is the right thing to do doesn't mean that every moment and season of your life is going to be blessing and mountaintop. Now stay with me because I have very good news about the, about the story of Joseph. But what we cannot do is say, well, I've been doing all this. Why is bad stuff still happening? Bad stuff happens. That's part of life. That's like a whole different sermon. But bad stuff happens. What we can't do is do enough good stuff to keep the bad stuff from happening. What we are called to do is do all the good stuff that God calls us to do so that we fulfill and embrace his destiny for our life. But in the fulfillment of the destiny, there may be some moments of prison and false accusations and bad stuff that happens. But ultimately and eventually, the destiny will be fulfilled. We do what God calls us to do so that we can reach the destiny he has for us. Genesis 41 and 1. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years. Pharaoh had a dream. We won't read all of it, but when Pharaoh has a dream, he can't find an interpretation of it. And the butler says, oh my gosh, I forgot about Joseph. He's probably dead. He's been in prison for the last two years. He goes to Pharaoh and says, hey, 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 I got an idea. This guy interpreted my dream. He told me exactly what was going to happen. Maybe he can help you. And they go, and Joseph is still alive in prison, two more years in prison. And they go and they get him, and they bring him before Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells him his dream. Joseph interprets it through the help of God. And in that moment, Pharaoh says, I want a guy like you helping me. And he makes him number two in the entire nation of Egypt. And in that moment, the dream and the destiny and the purpose is fulfilled. But he spent two full years in prison after the butler was released. But I promise you, in those two full years in prison, Joseph continued to serve others. He continued to have compassion, and he continued to get involved. That is what we do. That is the call of God on our life. So let me close with this. There is a condition that sociologists describe about the human condition called decision fatigue. It's called decision fatigue. And it says that it refers to the deteriorating quality of decisions made by an individual after a long session of decision making. You say, what in the world does that mean? I'll say, I'm so glad you asked. So you go to the grocery store and there's 19 different kinds of milk. You got regular milk. You got 2%. You got 1%. You got fat free. Then you got all your nut milks, right? You got your almond milk and you got your, I don't even know what else, oat milk. And you got, and you just go, wow, I got a lot of, a lot of milk to choose from here. So you have to make a whole bunch of decisions about milk. And then you go to soda because you got the, the oat milk. So you can drink a lot of Mountain Dew because you're fine because you got oat milk, right? So you got to decide which soda you're going to get. Then you got to figure out which lunch meat you're buying. And then you got to go to the bread aisle and you got to get, do you get white bread? Do you get wheat bread? Do you get whole grain? Do you get, I don't know. Can you milk made out of oats? Can you get bread made out of milk? I don't know. So, so you got all kinds of, right. And you do all this stuff and you choose and you choose and you choose and you grocery shop for an hour and you get to the checkout line and you look over and there's some Kit Kats right there. And you didn't want Kit Kats. You're not particularly hungry, but you have decision fatigue and the grocery stores know it. And that's why they put that candy right there. That's actually true. It's a true thing. They put that candy right there because they know that you had to choose between 19 different milks an hour ago and you have no ability to make good decisions any longer. And so you say, hey, that Kit Kat looks really good. 
and you eat it in the car before you drive home so your kids know you don't have candy, right? <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> right? That is decision fatigue. Now, the man who invented Apple computer, Steve Jobs, this is a fascinating thing. Steve Jobs said, I need to make as many good decisions in a day as I possibly can. And therefore, I cannot afford to waste decisions on unimportant things. So, Steve Jobs wore the same clothes every single day. Tennis shoes, jeans, black turtleneck. If you've ever seen a picture of Steve Jobs, that's what he's got on. Because Steve Jobs said, I'm not going to waste a decision. I may need to make a great decision at 6.30 at night. And if I've had to spend 10 minutes deciding what clothes I'm going to wear in the morning, I may not have the mental resources to make a quality decision at 6.30 at night. So I'm going to eliminate the clothes decision from my life. I'm just going to do the same thing every single day. That is what we need to get a hold of in the story of Joseph. Joseph fulfilled his destiny because when it came to three important things, he did the same thing every single day. Make, make it your goal, your plan to serve others. Practice servant leadership. To pay attention and to be concerned about the people around you. And above all, get involved when those people look like they need help. Do that. Don't decide, ooh, am I going to get involved here or not? That's how you miss God. That's how I missed God. Instead, save the decision stuff for other stuff. What are we going to have for dinner tonight? Save the decision stuff. But the decisions on serving others, being concerned, and getting involved, those you do those every day, every single day, the same way, over and over and over again. So you don't have to make a decision. You don't get fatigued. You don't say to yourself, I don't have enough time to check on my neighbor. I don't have enough time to ask my kids what's wrong. I don't have enough time to serve at the food basket. I don't have enough time to volunteer at the Winder Housing Authority. I don't have enough time to do all these things. And this person that I'm sitting on the same aisle with, they look sad during worship, but I don't have the time. I'm going to, don't do that. Take the decision making out of that. You say, this is what I do every single day. Every day, every week, every month. I do this. The other stuff we can decide on later. But you say, like Joseph, I will serve others. I will be concerned and I will get involved no matter what. I will do those things. Don't allow decision fatigue to rob you of ways that you can serve others in those moments. Joseph fulfilled his destiny because he was faithful in the small and the simple, and he was diligent and obedient. And because he was, because he did what he was supposed to do, he became who God called him to be. That is what God still wants for us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your presence. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you, to have your Holy Spirit move so powerfully. I ask that you finish this simple message in the hearts of every person here. Help us to practice servant leadership, not to take it for ourselves, but to serve others. Help us to be concerned and to pay attention to the people around us. And as we pay attention to them, God, give us, give us the decision, the, the, the strength, the courage, the obedience to get involved. As Joseph said to those men, tell me what's wrong. We also must get involved with the people around us. Help us to do this day in and day out, no matter what. Be with all of us. Move in this your church. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen and amen and amen.